Ah. Good evening, folks. If you're with us, my name is Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer at the Franklin Institute Science Museum in Philadelphia. And we're just getting started with our April edition edition of Skies at Home. In a few technical difficulties, hopefully you can still see me. I'll be back in just a second. There I am. My camera seems to want to turn on and off, so hopefully we'll be able to make all the connections work. Uh, what seems to be going on is we have an 11 storm here, and I don't know how it's affecting us, but it seems to me throwing my camera off every now and then. So I'm having a really difficult time uh, keeping the connection here. So we'll see if we can make this work somehow, and uh, hopefully that'll do what we need it to do. If this camera keeps sort of dropping out, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to switch cameras. And uh, let's just see right now and see if that makes it any easier for this to work. There we go. Let's try that and see how that works out. Let me just readjust it here, folks. Oh, man. There we go. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's see how that works, folks. Hopefully that works out just fine, okay? Hopefully we'll have a little bit more stability. Hopefully you're hearing my audio okay. Please uh, 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 accept my apologies for our little technical difficulties. You know these things happen every now and then, and here we're having some challenges. Uh, so hopefully everything will work out just fine from now on. Okay, so, so glad you can be with us this evening. Again, this is the April edition of Night Skies at Home. This is our regular monthly astronomy program that we have been doing online uh, since actually April of 2020. And so we're marking our two year point this month doing this program. For those of you that have been with us uh, consistently or a number of times, thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks for sticking with us as we go through this. Uh, this is a program that we are doing in place of our usual in-person Night Skies at the Observatory program that we do live at the Franklin Institute, in which we invite all of you to come down to the museum and join us, making use of the resources we have there to learn about the night sky. We have a beautiful rooftop observatory that has a great telescope in it, the Zeiss 10-inch refracting telescope, which is wonderful for viewing planets and bright stars in a downtown city environment. We also have a number of smaller instruments, I should say portable instruments, that we also use in the observatory. So we build that up to about four telescopes in the observatory. And then we have another five or six telescopes that we place on our fifth floor roof deck that overlooks the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. So you get a great view of the Benjamin Franklin Parkway at night. And we also have the telescopes up there for you to observe through also. We also have the Fels Planetarium on the first floor, our space exhibit. We also do plenty of activities to go with the evening's program. And that's our regular monthly night skies at the observatory program, uh, which we haven't gotten back to doing yet, but hopefully we'll get back to that sometime later this year. And we invite all of you to join us for that program so that uh, you can get your astronomy groove on. You can come down and take a look through a telescope, have an authentic science experience looking at the night sky, and uh, have some great views of the moon and some bright planets and some stars and other objects that we have available to be seen from Center City, Philadelphia. In the meantime, though, we bring you this program so that you can still enjoy the evening skies, even though you're doing it from home. So again, this is the April version of Night Skies at Home, a regular monthly astronomy program coming to you live from the Franklin Institute's Chief Astronomer's Observatory, located slightly off campus from downtown Philadelphia. But nonetheless, the information that we provide here is good for everybody observing across the United States. And in fact, the content that we provide this evening is good for all observers all around the planet at this general latitude of 40 degrees north. The only time we really have much divergence in the content in terms of what stars are available for anyone is if we go too far north or too far south. So that's how things are the same for observers around the planet on any given day. So if you're anywhere near this latitude, maybe up in London or maybe down in Spain, this is still good information for you. 
because in that latitude band, all around the planet, even as far as China, the night skies we see tonight will be the same sky seen by folks in China just a few hours later. So uh, this evening, we have a lot to chat about. Here we are, it's springtime now. So the nighttime stars have changed. And that means that we have new constellations we can look out for, new indicators of the spring season that we see in the night sky. We can talk about the planets that are available to be seen. And this month, we're also gonna talk a little bit about James Webb Space Telescope. We're gonna get into some more detail. There's some really cool technology that I've learned about recently that I'd like to share with you so that by the time James Webb Space Telescope actually begins operating in early summer, you will be the local neighborhood expert on what James Webb Space Telescope is all about. At the same time, I hope to bring you up to speed on NASA's latest rocket. This is the SLS, the Space Launch System. NASA's newest and biggest rocket it's ever built, the most powerful rocket it's ever built, I should say, actually. Not the tallest, but the most powerful rocket ever built. And this is the backbone upon which will be built the Artemis program. That's the program that will return humans to the moon and eventually take human explorers out to Mars. Now, there are some really interesting happenings that are coming up for, for that program in the not too distant future in just the next several months. Might even be a little bit shorter than that that you need to be aware of. So we'll also give you some information on that so you can be an expert in your neighborhood about that as well. Uh, we'll also talk just a little bit more uh, about uh, uh, our online program, A Practical Guide to the Cosmos, that you'll find at beyond.fi.edu, featuring myself and my co-host, Kalpana Pot, talking about all things astronomy. So we have a number of episodes that you can check into that have already aired, and a few more still coming. They drop on Mondays, so you can catch up with that. Uh, we've done about 10 episodes, I think, so far, and uh, you can catch those at beyond.fi.edu. So let's not forget about those. Spring highlights, and let's not forget two other things, your questions. We'd love to have your questions. If you have questions about astronomy, questions about the night sky, questions about James Webb Space Telescope, or questions about the SLS Space Launch System, well, we'll be happy to try to answer your questions. And if we can't answer them, which is totally possible. We don't have the answers to everything here. We can at least direct you someplace, I believe, where you might be able to find the information you're looking for. We'd also like to know, where are you enjoying this program from? Where are you listening to this program? Are you on this planet, maybe another planet, or where on this planet are you? We welcome all comers. Everybody can join us here to learn a bit about the night skies. This program is for everybody, all levels of observers, whether you're beginners or experts, we'll have some content for you. So thanks for joining us this evening. Again, let us know where you're coming in from, where you're uh, participating from, and uh, don't forget to send us your questions. So let's talk a little bit about sky phenomenon. First of all, right now, sunrise and sunset. Sunrises are coming earlier and earlier. Sunsets are coming later and later. So we're gaining in the number of minutes and hours of daylight as we move into spring and on towards summer. So I'm gonna mention that sunrise right now is coming at 6.33 a.m. And you know, if you think back to last month, I would have said at the beginning of March that sunrise was coming at 6.29 a.m. Now, wait a minute. There's a little bit of disconnection there between March and April. Well, if this is now April, shouldn't sunrise be coming earlier than it was back in March? Now it seems to be coming four minutes later. Yeah, there's a little bit of a trick there, and you've probably realized what that trick is. Between the last time we were together and tonight, the time shifted. We moved our clocks forward one hour. So that's what made the big difference. Uh, so 6.33 a.m. now is a whole hour's difference from what it would have been if we hadn't changed time. So uh, because of that time change, 6.33 is actually almost an hour earlier than it was when we talked about that before. But the sunsets, the sunsets have the same thing. Last month, that would have been 5.55 p.m. Sunsets are now coming at 7.23 p.m. So we have light now, very late into the evening, or pushing later into the evening, I should say. It will get later, but I noticed it when I was out, of course, like many of us, walking the dog a couple of days ago. 
By 8 p.m. in the evening, I could still see a sliver of light out on the western horizon, left over as, sun, as the sun was heading down below the horizon. We're getting about two and a half minutes per day right now, and we are up to almost 13 hours of daylight. 13 hours of daylight. We still have more to go. For the moon, guess what? The moon right now is at first quarter, seven days old. So now it's in the evening sky at a 90 degree angle to the sun, the vertex of that angle being the earth. So if you were to set up that right angle uh, situation, you'd have the moon out in the sky, you'd have the earth at the vertex and the sun at a 90 degree angle to the moon going right through the earth. So that's what makes it first quarter. We're seeing just half of all of the surface of the moon that is illuminated by the sun. We're seeing half of the half of the moon that's illuminated by the sun, which makes it a quarter, and it's our first quarter of this cycle of moon phases. You'll be able to see the moon in the evening sky after sunset, and I really encourage you to take a look for the moon every night the sky is clear. Now, for folks here in the Philadelphia area, we have a little problem with the weather right now. It's rainy this evening, in fact, cloudy. I heard some lightning and thunder, in fact, maybe you have too. But uh, as we get through the weekend, earlier next week, we'll have some clear skies in the evening. I encourage you to take a look for the moon and watch how its position changes from night to night when you observe at the same time. As you make that observation, the change that you see is a result of the moon making a uh, moving a little bit further along in its orbit around the earth every day the moon moon at another 128th or and uh what that does is that means that uh hopefully my audio is still okay somebody will let me know if there's a problem i just had a little thing flash on my screen telling me something about that but you'll be observing the moon as it makes its uh, as it moves along its orbit, one about 128th, 129th of its orbit every day. Uh, the moon cycle is 29 and a half days. So every day is 129th of that orbit about. So you'll see how that moves along. Uh, thanks very much, Katie. Uh, my studio director, not my studio director, but my uh, production director, uh, Katie, is letting me know that the audio is just fine. Thanks so much. Okay, so uh, let's finish this up, and then we'll go to some of your questions. Uh, so we got the moon all squared away. You know when that is? Oh, full moon, by the way, is on the 16th. The 16th, which is one day, one day before Easter. Easter is on the 17th this month. Uh, so that's just about, what, seven days from now, coming up soon. Uh, okay, uh, a little bit more than that, but coming up soon. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, we'll talk about spring constellations later. I mentioned that Easter is on the 17th. Uh, there is a partial eclipse of the sun coming up on April the 30th. But don't get excited. And the reason why is because, A, it's a partial eclipse. That can be fun too. But this one has its challenges because it's only going to be visible in the southern hemisphere. Where? Well, in the lower half of South America and also over in Antarctica. So that's going to be a little bit of a, a, little bit of a challenge. And I would also say in the western, during western southern ocean. Weather, Western Southern Ocean is where that eclipse will be visible. So uh, unless you happen to have a plan to be there April 30th, I'm not going to recommend you make plans to go see it. Now, if you're, if you're going to be in that direction, that's great. But uh, between now and then, uh, no need to make any plans for that. You'll have uh, better opportunities a little bit later in, uh, next year and in the following year. Okay, Grant. So uh, I was calling for questions to see if anybody had any questions. We don't have any questions just yet, but let's see if there's anybody, uh, we have any notice of anybody calling in, uh, listening to our program in places. I see, oh, I see Blair saying hello from South Jersey. Uh, she's watching with her Brownie Girl Scout uh, group, I think that is, uh, or her Brownie Girl Scout who is working her Space Science Adventurer badge. Hi, Blair. Uh, Susie wants to know. <laughs> Susie wants to know what kind of dog I have. Yes, I have a really lovely little poodle. Uh, it's a mid-sized poodle, and uh, sometimes he's in the room with us, but not tonight. Uh, so uh, a nice little, nice little guy, about thirty-five or forty pounds. Uh, Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth. In the, uh, Elizabeth says in the pre-dawn sky here. 
uh, near the waterfront on the shoreline of Connecticut, Elizabeth saw a streak-type silver stationary cluster in the southern sky. Is that Saturn? Wow, that's a great question, Elizabeth. I wish I could have been there to actually identify it with you somehow, because it's kind of difficult to do the forensic astronomy thing where you're trying to figure it out in this manner. Uh, I would say, um, just off the top of my head, I'll think about it some more during the program, Elizabeth. But if it's in the southern sky, no, it wouldn't be Saturn. Saturn would be found, uh, it could be found in the southern sky, but it would have to be higher in the southern sky. And right now, Saturn is in the pre-dawn sky, uh, just barely visible, low in the eastern sky, right or just before sunrise. So that makes it a bit more challenging. The streak-type silver stationary cluster in the south, you know what, I'm going to take a stab and say maybe that could have been the Pleiades, perhaps. I don't know. Uh, anyway, I'll see if I can uh, think about some, think some more about that and uh, give you a better answer on that, Elizabeth. But thanks for, uh, for joining us anyway. Uh, so, uh, folks, let's say hello to my studio producer here, the lovely Linda. She's over here. Say hi, Linda. Hello, everybody. There she is. And I think... Uh, we got a joke from Blair. We have a joke. Blair has, Blair has sent us a joke. So, uh, so what is it? Uh, she said... Uh, what's your favorite constellation? But that's not the joke. The joke. It went away. Oh, my joke. The joke went away. Oh, we're sorry to have seen that oh, disappear. Let's from Maria. How does the man on the moon cut his hair? Maria asks, how does the man on the moon cut his hair? Huh. Uh, I'm going to say, I don't know. Eclipses it. No, no. <laughs> Did you hear that, folks? How does the man on the moon cut his hair? Eclipses it. Get it? Eclipse? Eclipse? Yeah, okay, right. You know, I really love bad jokes, especially bad science jokes uh, like, like this one here. Thank you very much for that, Maria. We'll have to put that one uh, in the repository of bad astronomy jokes. Thank you so much. But funny. Yeah, but funny. Okay, great. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that. We certainly do appreciate that. Uh, Joel, I think Joel has a question. What is it? Are there any online sites that show eclipses live? Joel wants to know if there are any online sites, any online websites that show eclipses live. Well, guess what? In this day and age where anybody can uh, put together a webcam system and throw it up on their laptop, there are so many sites that are available. And they typically uh, reveal themselves, Joel, just before the solar eclipse, like in the weeks before the solar eclipse. So you can easily find one of these. And in fact, for this eclipse that's coming up on April 30th, I'm sure that you'll be able to find a webcam uh, viewing of that solar eclipse, even though uh, it's so far south. So you know, some, some location in South America will be airing that for sure. So uh, here's what I'll do as we get closer to that date. I'll uh, dig that up and I'll uh, try to, I'll post that uh, at my Twitter site, Cool Astronomer. Uh, if you go to, uh, if you look on Twitter at Cool Astronomer, I'll post it there. And we'll also post it on the Franklin Institute's Facebook page as well. So if you come back to our Facebook page about a week before that eclipse, we'll have a location where you can go observe that eclipse on the web. Joel, that was a great question. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. That gets us uh, back in the flow on being able to watch eclipses, even though they may be too far for us to go. And uh, you'll also get some great commentary as well from the uh, science agencies that will offer that. Uh, there are a number of science museums that will have a connection somehow to that, and other astronomy agencies, uh, particularly in this in the in South America, uh, like European Southern Observatory, uh, is one agency I can think of that probably will have that. Uh, so we'll get that together for you so you'll have that available. Thanks a lot. Greatly appreciate that, Joel. Any other questions? Yes, indeed. Um, Katie says that 12-year-old Claire would like to know um, what you think about magnetic fields because she's learning it in school. Oh, 12-year-old Claire would like to know what I think about magnetic fields. 
Claire, magnetic fields are so amazingly interesting because they have so much wide application, or shall I say, um, representation? No. Presence in so many things astronomical. Just incredible. And here's one of my favorites. I learned this from a young man that was a guest on another radio program that I do for WXPN on Kids Corner. And uh, this young man who called into this program asked if he could talk to me about this really interesting phenomenon called magnetars. Magnetars. Now, these magnetars, Claire, are rotating neutron stars, but they have a very, very high and intense magnetic field. And because the magnetic field is so intense, it causes all sorts of other really wild effects to happen uh, at these planets. And, you know, one of those is that they blast out intense amounts of energy, both in the uh, radio spectrum, I should say. So they appear as like flashing stars, but they also have these very, very high magnetic fields that surround the planet that cause all kinds of other odd things to happen. So you'll find that magnetic fields are everywhere, everywhere, everywhere in astronomy. And so uh, to understand astronomy well, it also helps to understand magnetic fields as well as electrical fields. They often go together and you know, work related to each other in very interesting ways. So that's a great question, Claire. Thank you very much. Just like the magnetic fields that you've been studying in school, yeah, those magnetic fields are in space. Guess what? There's, a, there's one location that's really close to us, Claire, that has a major magnetic field that has an effect on Earth. And it's a star that's right nearby us. And which star is it that's right nearby us? You guessed it. It's the sun. The sun has very intense magnetic fields. And those magnetic fields govern what we see on the surface of the sun all the time. And in fact, uh, if you look up sunspots online, Claire, you'll find that sunspots are often, um, often manifest themselves very much like a bar magnet does. Uh, there's a really easy experiment that you can do using a bar magnet, a sheet of paper, and iron filings. The iron, you place the bar magnet on a table, put a piece of paper on top, sprinkle iron filings. The iron filings will assume the shape of the magnetic field caused by the bar magnet. And sunspots display the same kind of uh, visible phenomenon of the magnetic fields that, are, that uh, sunspots are associated with. So lots of great stuff there, Claire. Thanks a lot. That's a great question. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, we have plenty more. Oh, great. We'll take another two questions. Okay, then let's start with Karen. She says, hello, I want to introduce myself. I'm an older person, and this is my first time tuning in learning more about you thanks for joining us karen glad, glad to have you with us what's your question that's it she was introducing oh herself. you're just introducing yourself thanks for joining us karen i hope you learn a lot of interesting stuff here that you can actually you know sort of either how do i say it uh encourage you to learn more or actually go out and take a look at the night sky to see what you can see where you are thanks for tuning in karen greatly appreciate it what's next James would like to know, what star rises early in the morning in the eastern sky, north of the rising sun? It's not Venus, is it? Yes, in fact, Venus is out there. So there are a few planets out there right now. There's uh, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. I should say Venus, Mars, uh, and Saturn are the most easily visible ones. Jupiter will be joining them later in the month. And we'll show you that on a star map a little bit later in the program, but yes. That really bright object you see in the pre-dawn sky over in the east, that is Venus. Memorize what that looks like because Venus looks like that and only Venus can look like that. No other object in the evening sky can look quite like that. So that's a really, that's a really good one to, uh, to know about and understand is, and to understand what it looks like. And the reason why it's good to understand what it looks like is because it's not always in the pre-dawn sky. It will change its position over time, over a number of months, and end up in the evening sky, visible after sunset. So it might be confusing at first why you're seeing this similar star-like object in the morning sky now and then in the evening sky. And it's all about Venus and its orbit around the sun and where that orbital position change places it in our sky for observing. And so if we learn what it looks like, anytime you see it, you'll be able to identify it as Venus. 
So that's a really good way to do that is get a good look at that in the pre-dawn sky. Thanks a lot for that, James. What's up next? Yes. Blair's daughter, Nora, wants to know, what's the history and the story of the telescope at the Franklin Institute? <laughs> Blair would, uh, Blair's daughter, Nora, would like to know what the history is of the telescope at the Franklin Institute. I'll have to do a quick one because it has a long history, but the short of it is actually, Nora, is that the telescope was installed at the Franklin Institute in the summer of 1933. Believe it or not, when the Franklin Institute building was sort of still under construction, and that's along with the very first planetarium instrument the Franklin Institute had. They both come from the same company. The company is the Zeiss Optical Company. And uh, in 1932 or so, 1931, we ordered those devices. They were built and then sent to us over the summer of 1933, installed in the museum then. We've been using the telescope there to observe the sky uh, almost every day since then. This past two years has been the first time that the observatory has been closed for such a long time. Uh, but the telescope is used almost every day for observing the sun. We have very special filters that protect your eyes. And then we've been doing nighttime observing at the Franklin Institute also since 1934, when the building first opened to the public. So we had the telescope for a little while before the museum actually opened in January of 1934. And we've been using that same telescope ever since. It's a great telescope. You know, for its age right now, it's actually quite young. It moves at a very slow rate of speed. It's very well built and very well balanced. So uh, it works uh, almost as, as good today as it did when it was first installed. So it's a really wonderful telescope for us to have. Thanks for asking about that, Nora. One more question. Maria would like to know, does the moon actually affect human behavior? Oh, was that Marie? It says Maria. Maria wants to know, does the moon actually affect your behavior? Uh, we'd like to say that it affects your behavior. Uh, but if we actually think about it, the moon doesn't affect our behavior any more than any other astronomical uh, object affects our behavior. So uh, it's great for us to see it and know it and know something about it. But uh, directly, maybe you're thinking about the gravitational pull or maybe the illumination or something of that sort affecting us in some way. And you know, we'd have to say it does affect us in that the moon's influence on the planet Earth has been significant in that the moon has helped to slow the rotation of our Earth so that life could develop on this planet in the way that it has. Now, there are many, many factors that have gone into that, but that's probably the most direct way that we can say that the moon has, that, that the moon has affected us, or that, a moon, that the moon affects us. Many people often say that certain kinds of behaviors are more prevalent at different times of the moon's cycle. But think about it. The moon is always about the same distance from Earth, and the lighting from the moon changes not that much, but it's not the lighting since the light is reflected from the sun anyway. So in that case, you'd say that the sun would affect us, right? So if we think about the proximity and the gravitational attraction and things like that, yes, we know it affects the tides on the earth and things of that sort. That's true. But it's very, very, very difficult. And we're really way out on the limb if we want to try to say that the moon affects us individually. Of course we can, can, maybe we might want to say that we feel like that happens. It's very, very, very difficult to pinpoint and identify that the moon's position today caused a particular and specific behavior in any one of us today, simply because of the moon. We'd have to eliminate every other factor on the planet to be able to identify the moon as being responsible for a particular behavior. So it's an interesting question to think about, but, but thanks anyway for that. Okay, great. So let's move on. We'll come back to some more questions later, folks. So tonight, one of the things we wanted to do was we wanted to talk about James Webb Space Telescope and help people understand a bit about James Webb Space Telescope. So in order to do that, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna share my screen so that I can go over to a particular website that I wanna make sure you're well aware of. I'm gonna to come to my desktop here. I'm gonna come right out to, 
oh yeah, here we are. I'm gonna come right out to my Firefox screen here. And I'm going to jump over to, let me see, here we are. I can see what I'm doing. There we are. And I'm going to start first right over here. Hopefully we all can see this. I'm going to make my screen a little bit bigger. There we go. And I'm going to minimize myself because I don't really need to see myself here. Thanks, just doing a little screen keeping. Okay, so hopefully right now what you're seeing is you're seeing the James Space Telescope website at Goddard Space Flight Center. And what this website is showing us is what the conditions are and where Webb Space Telescope is right now out in space. So let's just take a look at what we have here on the screen. So what we have here on the screen right now is we're seeing, first of all, the temperatures of where Space Telescope is right now. And so as you look at this, the object that's right in the center of the screen that I'm circling with my cursor right now is actually the James Webb Space Telescope. The yellow and orange portions that you see here, these are the warmest parts of the telescope right now. The warmest parts of the telescope. And you'll see them labeled as A and B. Now, if we go a little bit further to the left, we can come to this first column of numbers, which are labeled the hot side. And over here on the hot side, we'll see that the temperature on the hot side is 127 degrees Fahrenheit at point A and 56 degrees at point B. And this is Fahrenheit. So these are temperatures that we can relate to. 127 is a little warm for us, but there are places on Earth where the temperature can get to about 130 degrees as a record temperature. That's not typical. That's a little bit uh, of an extreme. Uh, but 56 degrees, I think that's about the temperature outside right now. It's about 56 degrees. Now let's think about where this is. This telescope right now is at a position called L2, a Lagrangian point, as it's called. And this is a point in space where there is a balance between the gravitational attraction of the sun and the gravitational attraction of the earth. And so what happens is this spacecraft can sit at that balance point with great stability, and it won't move very much from that location. Now that's a really great position for it to be because for this spacecraft to do what it needs to do, it needs to be able to sit at a point quite distant quite distant from the Earth and from the Sun. In this case, it's about a million miles away, just under a million miles away. At that point, it's far enough away from the Sun and from the Earth that it's not receiving as much heat as it would be receiving if it were much closer to the Earth. This is a telescope that needs to operate at a very, very low temperature. And the lower we can get that temperature, the better it will operate. And right now, you see that the backside is 127 degrees in one, pot, one spot, 156 degrees in another spot. What scientists really want is they want the temperature of the spacecraft to be even colder. So if we go back to the center drawing of the telescope and look at the blue components, now we see that the temperature is really, really cold. This is now the cold side of the telescope. And if we go to the first column of numbers right next to the telescope on the left, we see that the temperature at point C, point C is minus 383 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow, negative 383 degrees. And at point F, it's even cold. I'm sorry, at point D, it's even colder, 394 degrees colder, just about 10 degrees cooler. So between the front side and the back side, oh my goodness, it's over 100, what is that? Almost 500 degrees temperature difference between those two points on the front side and the back side. And the front side, the cold side of the telescope needs to be cold so that the instruments can be as cold as they can possibly be. So the columns on the right now show you the temperature of the different sensors, the different instruments, on board the telescope. You can see where they're located, one, two, three, four, and five on the blue side of the telescope. So the temperature is really, really low. 
The spacecraft is out at about a million miles. And from that location, what it's going to do is it's going to continue to look out into space. And it's going to be looking for objects at the farthest reaches of the universe that are representative of the earliest history of our universe. We're looking for stars, very young stars, and we're looking particularly for very young galaxies. In fact, we're looking for some of the first galaxies, and hopefully we'll be able to see some of the first stars. So right after the universe began, first stars were created, and then those stars eventually evolved such that they could become the seeds for the beginnings of the first galaxies. And it's that period of time between when the universe began and galaxies were typically forming that we're hoping to gain more information about the early history of the universe. And James Webb Space Telescope hopefully will be able to help us do that. It uses devices that sense heat coming from distant objects. Now you would think a telescope might be looking for light so it can take photographs of objects at tremendous distances. But these objects are so far away and moving away from us at a high enough rate, rate of speed that any radiation that we think of as light, like what our eyes would see, doesn't take that form anymore. It has now shifted down the spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum, such that the only kind of radiation we can detect because they're so far away is heat. And I mean heat like what you feel from the oven what you feel from your toaster, what you feel from an iron, but, but very, very, very low temperature heat. So if we look at our tools that are on board the telescope again, in this first column of blue numbers to the right of the instrument, there are four, uh, there are three devices here and two devices in the second list. Well, these devices need to be operated at temperatures even lower than what you see here. So if you have a detector that is currently minus 433 degrees, and it sees an object that's at minus 233 degrees, that's 200 degrees warmer, that object is going to appear to be very bright to the telescope. The telescope will see it as a very bright object. If the telescope and the object were at the same temperature, the object wouldn't be visible. So we need the telescope to be colder than everything else it's going to observe. So the other objects will show up to the telescope. That's why the telescope is so cold. So this web page that you see here, which is where is web telescope, you can easily look this up yourself and learn a tremendous amount about the temperature regime for the telescope. So at the bottom of the sheet now, you can see what's going to be happening over the next several months. Uh, right now, the, temper the telescope has arrived at its location. And as time continues to go on across this bar at the bottom, what will happen is the telescope components will continue to cool down. And you can see the different steps that are going to happen as the telescope is both cooling down and as it's being aligned and tested for real science to begin early this summer and into the rest of the fall and into next year. So here's a great site that will give you the information you need to understand about the temperature. But let's talk about one of these devices in particular and how it works. We're gonna talk about how the telescope itself collects information. One of the things that this telescope wants to do is it wants to be able to gather spectra of objects at great distances. Now, why does it want to collect information about the spectra of objects at great distance? The spectra of an object, the spectrum of the radiation coming from an object, can easily help us understand a lot of very important things about that object. We can understand composition, we can understand density, we can understand temperature, we can understand motion. And when we put all of that information together, it begins to create a picture that will allow us to understand how that object operates. Now, 
If we're looking at objects that are a tremendous distance away, they are incredibly, incredibly small. Now, what Webb Telescope is going to do about making observations of galaxies at these extreme distances of, say, 13 to 14 billion light years away, is it wants to be as efficient as it can. And that means that scientists want to be able to gather spectral information from a number of different objects at one time. And they have a very special camera that will do that. And this very special camera uses what are called micro shutters. And here's how they're constructed. In the photograph that you see right now, this is a photograph of one section of one of the sensors that uses micro shutters. This one sensor that's showing these micro, micro uh, shutters here is about one and a half inches square. Now the picture you're seeing is an enormous magnification. Why, how is it enormous or how enormous is it? Here's how enormous it is. On that one and a half inch square de uh, detector, there are 64,000, 64,000 of these little tiny doors. Now in the center of the picture, you can see that most of the doors are closed and one of the doors is open. And a little probe has been stuck through one of the doors here. Now, here's how this really cool device works. First of all, there are four of those one and a half inch squares that each have 64,000 shutters. So if you multiply that out, that comes up to about 250,000 of these tiny little doors. But how do these tiny little doors work? And so Nora, I think I have something for you related to magnetic fields. And that is that magnetic fields are used to help operate these doors. And what scientists do is open and close the doors according to the star field they see. So they point the detector toward the night sky. They see a field of galaxies, identify which galaxies they'd like to observe and get spectra from. And then what they do is they use an electric current with a magnetic field to reset all the doors. First, they're closed. Then what they do is they use that magnetic field and electric current again to open all of these tiny little doors. Oh, by the way, how small are they? Well, the doors are 100 microns wide by 200 microns long. That still doesn't tell you how big they are, does it? Well, here's how you know. A human hair is about 75 microns wide. 75. So because of that, that means that these doors are really, really, really tiny. They're really tiny. Think about that again. Just a little bit bigger than the thickness of a human hair. That's how small these doors are. So the electric current and the magnetic field can open and close the doors. So again, first you set the doors closed, then the doors are set to be open, and then selectively, engineers from Earth can send a signal to the telescope saying which doors should be open and which doors should be closed to correspond to the star field that's being observed. Now in doing so, with this array of four of these put together, making up nearly 250,000 doors, what they can do now is they can take up to 100 spectral images at once. This is really, really efficient, especially in the case of a telescope like a space telescope. And we can do something similar to this on Earth, but we aren't able to reset the doors as scientists can do with these micro shutters. Here on Earth, we have devices that will create uh, plates that are used for star fields. And I mean like an aluminum plate, a physically big sized aluminum plate that has holes drilled in it to match the pattern of stars when the telescope is set just right. But if you want to do a different star field, you have to take that plate out and put a new plate in. In this case, all you have to do is just change the electric current, and that way you can open and close the doors, the shutters, and configure the shutters to match the star field you want to observe. So that's a really, really great technology to be used in this telescope that allows the telescope to do a lot of science over and over and over and over again. 
Well, the telescope has a lifetime of hopefully they believe they'll be able to use this telescope effectively without any problem for about 10 years. So that means they'll be able to do hundreds of millions of examinations or data collection uh, for galaxies at these distant edges of the, of the early portion of the universe. So micro shutters, these micro shutters are a really cool technology developed just for this. And without the micro shutters, I'm not sure the telescope, uh, how much the telescope would really be worth using considering that it has such a high expense, it's been put at such a distant location where it can't be serviced. I think the mi micro shutter application really makes James Webb Space Telescope a unique and fantastic instrument. We'll learn more about that in the future, but just remember you can go to this website. You can go to web.nasa.gov slash micro shutters, or if you just search micro shutters web, you can come to this site and you can learn all about micro shutters. Now that's a great picture of those micro shutters. We can see in this photograph right down here, here's a whole array of the micro shutters. And here is one of the postage stamp sized sensors that has the 62,000, I said it was 64, I was over by 2,000, 62,000 individual windows as micro shutters on this. And there are four of these on board the detector that is using that. The spectra that'll be collected may look something like this. And what's actually happening with this is the light that's being gathered from the galaxies is being broken up into their individual spectra. And the spectra indicate the composition of the object that's being observed by the placement of the dark lines you see on every one of these thin sort of brownish rainbow strips. That, my friends, is an entirely different sort of lesson about astronomy and how astronomers learn about objects in the sky. And we can talk about that in a different program. But I just wanted to give you this introduction, this brief introduction to the micro shutters. Okay, let's move on. Uh, because we also want to be able to get in this evening a little bit of information about the launch vehicle that is uh, that NASA is preparing for the next mission out to the moon. So uh, we're still sharing the screen, and I'm just going to switch pages right now so that we can see where we are here, talking about the space launch system. So if you hold on for just a second, we'll switch over to that. Okay, we've talked about this a little bit before, but we're now coming up on a major milestone. NASA Space Launch System, or SLS rocket, has been built, assembled, and just this past weekend was set up on a launch pad at Kennedy Space Center for its very first dress rehearsal for a launch that will be coming up in just a few months. Now, if everything goes well with the dress rehearsals, this past one, and I think maybe at least one more coming up in the next few weeks, if all of those go well, then this rocket will be set to make its first trip into space, its first real trip into space. But do you realize that this first real trip into space will be taking this rocket all the way out to the moon? Yes, all the way out to the moon. One of the things that I think many people did not realize about NASA's space launch system is that it's almost ready to go now and that its first trip will actually be a test flight all the way out to the moon. Now, what I'm showing you here on the screen is what's called the SLS Reference Guide. And you can have access to this at NASA's website. All you have to do is search up SLS Reference Guide and you'll find this really wonderful guide that gives you all sorts of information about not only the rocket, but the capsule that's atop the rocket and the whole program that this rocket is meant to support. So in the photograph that you're seeing here, this is the capsule plus the service module and the escape tower that are being winched up to the very top of the rocket that you can see in the background image here. 
So I'm going to continue to scroll down through the table of contents and just come down to uh, this one photograph that shows you what the full rocket looks like. Now it's standing atop the crawler that moves the rocket from the vertical assembly building out to the launch pad in Florida. This rocket is 322 feet tall. Now that's not as tall as the Saturn V moon rockets that were 365 feet tall, but the Saturn V moon rockets provided 7.5 million pounds of thrust to lift the astronauts and all the equipment they needed to visit the moon off the surface of the Earth. But this rocket, SLS, can produce, I think, a million pounds more thrust, 8.5 million pounds of thrust. So this makes it the most powerful rocket ever built. And so here, if we take a look under the SLS Quick Facts, and again, you can go to the website and see all this information. You'll see a full breakdown of all of the components of the rocket here. I'm just scrolling along quickly because I just wanted to be able to show you this. And we can come right down here to what's called SLS Block 1 by the numbers. Now, Block 1 refers to which mission it would be flying. So for this very first mission, here we can see the rocket sitting on top of the mobile launch platform, the crawler that's going to take it out to the pad. And over on the left, we see that it's 322 feet tall. It has four liquid propellant rocket engines, and the maximum thrust is 8.8 .8 million pounds. So again, about a million pounds more thrust than the NASA rockets had. And we can see information about the internal core stage. That's the one that uses the four uh, uh, RS-25 rocket motors. But it also uses, in addition to that, solid rocket boosters. And they are on either side of the main core, and they provide additional thrust to carry the payloads up to space. So as we continue looking through this guide, you can see that there's plenty of information about the rocket, where it's going, what it's going to do, and all of the definitions that we need to understand a bit about this. Now, here's the really critical thing that you should understand about this for right now. And I'm going to switch pages once more just so I can cover this for you. I'm going to stop our view right around here at this page. And I'm going to skip right over here. And this is NASA's web page for the Artemis mission, the overall program that's going to launch this rocket and astronauts back to the moon. And you'll notice that this is from April 5th, which was earlier this week. Last weekend, NASA uh, ran through one of its dress rehearsals, what they call a wet dress rehearsal. And the wet dress rehearsal is when they fill the rocket with propellant, oxidizer, they turn on all of the systems and they run a countdown as if they're actually going to launch the rocket. But they take the countdown down to about 30 seconds or so before launch and stop the countdown. Obviously, they don't want to launch the rocket. They're not really ready yet. So they stop the countdown. They just wanted to practice. So then what they had planned to do was to set the countdown clock back to about 30 minutes before launch, run through the last 30 minutes again, take it down to almost 10 seconds before launch, and then stop everything. And again, this is just practice so that they can check to see that all of the different components of the rocket are working properly. Now, during the dress rehearsal, it gives them a chance to catch flaws. They caught a couple of flaws. This, we now have a chance to fix those flaws, correct those things that went wrong, do another dress rehearsal to make sure everything is working just fine. And then what's going to happen is, within a few months, NASA is going to launch this gigantic rocket and send it all the way out to the moon. It's going to orbit the moon several times, and then the capsule will come back to Earth. And this is going to be the first step in us returning human explorers to the moon. We haven't had a big rocket go out to the moon like this since 1971, a long, long time ago, 50 years ago now. So this is going to be a really big deal.
that's going to happen in the next couple of months. So if you stay on top of this website and hang with our program, by the time we get around to this, again, you're going to end up being your local neighborhood expert in all things related to the SLS rocket system, the Artemis program. You'll know where to go to find information about this. You'll be able to share this information with your, with your friends. And you can also along with the program as this is actually happening. So we'll be able to see to it that uh, you'll be able to follow along with the adventure as the venture unfolds. So this is like the Apollo mission for this generation today of returning to the moon. Okay, so folks, we've talked a lot here about the Artemis mission. We've talked a lot about space, James Webb Space Telescope. Let's take a few minutes now to just take a look at the night sky, what's gonna be available for us to see in the evening sky right now. I'm still sharing my screen, but now I'm gonna switch over to another website called Stellarium Online. Solarium Online is a home planetarium application that anybody can use. If you just look up stellarium-web.org, you can come to it. As I use this, I get rid of the menu on the left-hand side of the screen. And now as you look at the screen here, you can see that we are oriented looking toward the northern sky. You can manipulate this screen using your cursor to click and drag, and I'm going to click and drag the sky around until we're looking out toward the south. And I might be wondering at what time I'm observing the southern sky. And right now I can look down in the lower right hand corner and I can see that it's 8.50. 8.50 in the evening, 20.50 over here in the lower right hand corner. And I can even see the date that I'm working with. And if I wanted to change it, all I have to do is click on that gray square and I can adjust my date and adjust my time as I like. But we'll leave it for this right now, and I'll just click and drag as we need to. So as we're looking here into the sky, we can see that there are a number of bright stars in the sky. The bright stars that we see that are just to the right of direct south, we're seeing the stars that are part of the winter circle of constellations. These are all bright stars that are oriented around the constellation Orion the Hunter, and these stars are those main stars of the winter sky. But since we're in the spring, we need to move over a little bit further to the left of those. So those constellations of the winter are to the right or to the west of south. We're going to look back over toward the east of south. And as we move right over here, one of the first things we notice are these odd squares with green rectangles connected to them all in a line. And you've got to be wondering, what could they possibly be? Well, these are satellites that we are seeing that are part of what's called the Starlink communication system. SpaceX has placed in orbit around the Earth a series of communication satellites that are meant to produce high quality, low cost internet accessibility all around the planet. And they travel along in these long strings of several satellites per string. There can be up to 20 satellites per string. But when we talk about groups of satellites like this doing work like this, they are called constellations. So this constellation of satellites is called Starlink. And in this particular, uh, in this particular program, we can actually click on the object and see which ones they are. So they are clicked on Starlink 3657. I'm going to click on 3636. And 3635 has already disappeared from view. And now that we've taken a look at those and you know what they are, we can release them. They're visible in the sky almost every night now. Uh, and they encircle the planet. So they provide that internet access all over the planet. Now to help us identify what we're seeing in the sky, we also have this really cool feature as part of this. This uh, triangle at the bottom of the screen and the menu bar down there allows us to put the artwork uh, or to put the constellation outline shapes up in the sky so you can see what the constellations are. Here's Orion the Hunter over to the west of south, and here's Leo the Lion over to the east of south. Leo was the main constellation of the spring sky, and as you look around, you can see the other constellation constellations that surround Leo, part of the spring sky. Cancer. Ursa Major, Urotes, Virgo, Hydra, 
Crater, Corvus. Now, Corvus, Crater, Cancer, their stars aren't very bright, so they'll be difficult to see. But it'll be easy to see the stars of Ursa Major, particularly the Big Dipper. Everybody knows the Big Dipper. Leo the Lion, these bright stars are easy to see. They form a backwards question mark to begin with, a backwards question mark uh, with a right triangle connected on the eastern side. And if we add some artwork to that, then they become recognizable as the stories we know of the night sky. So Leo, of course, is Leo the lion, and we can see the lion as it faces the west. We can see the big bear of Ursa Major up near the top of the sky. We can find Virgo right over here, just above the eastern horizon. And then Bootes over here is a little bit further north with its bright star, Arcturus. The cool thing about finding these constellations is they're kind of easy to link together in a very simple way. If you can identify the Big Dipper up near the top of the sky, you can take the handle of the Big Dipper and extend the curve down to this nice bright orange star called Arcturus. Nice and bright, easy to recognize, no problem whatsoever. If you continue the line, you'll come down to another bright star here that's part of Virgo called Spica. So you can take the arc of the handle of the Big Dipper, come down to Arcturus, arc to Arcturus, and you can speed on that curve down to Spica. So arc to Arcturus and speed on to Spica. So even if you are working in an urban environment where the sky may be bright, you can still see these bright stars that identify these bright constellations. If you live in a spot where the sky is much darker, where you don't have much city light, you'll be able to see those stars and much more. Some of the dimmer stars will show up as well. As you can see, as we've moved a little bit closer toward the nine o'clock hour, we have another string of these uh, Starlink satellites coming over. And so you can see that there are plenty of them. And these are also visible under clear, dark skies. So you can look for those as well. So this particular map works really well to help us identify constellations that are visible to us no matter where we are. If we wanted to advance the time, that would help us identify when planets are visible. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull this around a little bit. I'm going to alter the time here to take us into the pre-dawn sky, and I'm going to go hour by hour. I'm now up to just about midnight. Look where Arcturus is now, much higher in the eastern sky. We're at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 5 a.m. Here we are, 5 o'clock in the morning. Let me get rid of the box here for right now. And if you look low on the eastern horizon, just to the south of east, you can see brilliant Venus there as the big white dot. And you can see Mars and Saturn right next to Venus, right here. So I'm going to advance the time a few minutes, though, so that we can bring it up higher in the sky. So I'm just going to hold the button until we get to just before sunrise. Let me bring it back a little bit. Sort of manipulating time here. It's kind of fun. Let's get down to 5.30. We'll get rid of the box. And here we are now. Now you can see well above the eastern horizon, Venus. Mars and Saturn at 5.30 in the morning. I'm going to do one more manipulation for you because I'd like to take this out to the end of the month. Remember I said earlier that April 30th, there's a solar eclipse? Well, look what happens by April 20th. By April 20th, if we just come back to a little bit earlier in the morning, say 5.15, look what we have now. Now we have Saturn, Mars, Venus, and Jupiter. This is on April 20th at 5.15 in the morning. But check this out. In the southern sky on that date is the moon. Let's adjust this day by day and watch what happens with the moon. We're going to go forward day by day. Notice how the moon creeps closer to those planets. So that by the 23rd, we now have an alignment of Jupiter, Venus, Mars, Saturn, and the moon coming up from the eastern horizon. If we go to the 24th, the moon is even closer to Saturn. We go a little bit closer. The moon, very, very thin now, is between Mars and Saturn. And as we get closer, the moon gets even thinner. But also notice, 
how Jupiter and Venus switch locations by the 28th. So the great sky observing thing to do folks for this month in April. As I close this out, stop sharing my screen here and come back right to here is, a really great observation for us to make this month is in the pre-dawn sky toward the end of the month at 515 looking out toward the east, particularly for those folks who live down near the New Jersey shore, or if you live near the eastern shore of the United States, you'll have a really great opportunity to catch these planets just above the horizon in the morning. Don't forget that by the 20th, this, 20th of this month, you'll have those four planets in line, both some of the closest planets to us, Venus, for example, and two of the more distant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, along with another neighbor, Mars. The moon joins them by the 21st or so, and day by day, as we get on toward the 28th, the moon comes and slides along underneath those planets, and hopefully with clear skies and a good place for you to view, you will be able to see how this happens and note how the planets change position in the sky. Now, let's not forget, the Earth is a moving platform. And it's our changing position around the sun that makes it seem as if those planets are changing their position in the sky. The only planet in the sky moving faster than we are is Venus. Jupiter moving so slowly doesn't change very much in just a few days. So it has to be our platform that changes more quickly. That gives us a lot to look at this month. We have the great constellations of the spring sky to look for, and we have these great planets to look for also. So folks, as we come to the end of our program this month, don't forget a couple of great things for you to keep track of. James Webb Space Telescope. You can go online and learn all about James Webb Space Telescope. If you just do something like Micro Shutters Webb, you can learn about the micro shutters on the detectors on James Webb Space Telescope. Or if you say, where is Webb? Search where is Webb. You'll be able to find out where Webb Telescope is and what its progress is at its as its instruments cool down over the next several months so that it can become operational in early summer. And finally, let's not forget that the launch, that the space launch system, NASA's newest rocket, is poised for its next mission, its first mission to circumnavigate the moon coming up in just a few months. So if you keep those things in mind, you'll have plenty to do to keep you busy as you're familiarizing yourself with the night sky. Now, this is a great time to actually begin viewing the sky because the temperatures are getting warmer. It's nice to be out in the evening now, and you'll have something to do when you're out there observing. Of course, my favorite observation is International Space Telescope. You can also, I'm sorry, not International Space Telescope. My favorite observation is International Space Station. International Space Station. And you can find that as well too. It's visibility where you live. If you go to nasa.gov again, and, I, and just type into their search bar, C-I-S-S, or see the station actually are the words you should use. See the station, let me get it straight. Spot the station, there we go. Spot the station, if you use that, that will help you uh, find out when you can see Space Telescope over your location, no matter where you are in the United States. It's always fun to see International Space, International Space Station. And there are, I believe, 10 astronauts on board International Space Station right now, or soon will be in the next couple of weeks, up to 10 astronauts on board. And of course, as I always say, if you go out to view International Space Station, take someone out with you to see it, and don't forget to wave at the astronauts as they go by. Uh, so let's take uh, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, yeah, okay, so James so, wants to know what causes flares? Ah, what causes sun flares? That's a great question. It's all about the dynamics of the sun. The sun is very hot. Sometimes the magnetic fields on the sun prevent some of the energy from escaping evenly. And so there are eruptions of energy on the sun when those magnetic fields suddenly unwind themselves. They tend to wrap themselves up as the sun rotates. And if you were to take a rubber band and twist it up nice and tight, you'd find that there's a lot of energy bound up in that. And that's the same thing that happens on the surface of the sun with magnetic fields. They get bound up as the uh, sun rotates. 
And once they uncoil themselves, they release energy, and we see this energetic release as solar flares. That's a great question. We have a, we've had a few solar flares in the last couple of weeks, but we'll be seeing more of those in the next couple of years as the sun moves in its activity levels up to its maximum uh, of uh, uh, activity uh, for this particular solar cycle, which uh, began just about a year ago. What's next? Carly would like to know, do you think the sun will blow up one day? Carly would love to know if I think the sun is going to blow up one day. Uh, at some point in the very distant future, Carly, the sun is going to begin to change. It's going to grow in size as it ages and its composition begins to shift around in terms of percentages of what's inside it, hydrogen versus helium and things like that. And uh, our sun is not really big enough to explode in a very energetic fashion like some stars are, uh, but it will change, it will grow, it will cool and eventually shrink. So you don't have to worry about that though. That will happen Nine at about 5 billion years from now when it begins to change, Carly. So we have 5 billion years before it begins to change. Very cool. Folks, thanks a lot for joining us this evening. We're very glad you could be with us. We had a few technical difficulties getting started, but we're glad you could hang in with us. We hope this information will be useful to you. Don't forget, the Franklin Institute is now open seven days a week on its usual schedule, uh, 9.30 until 6, actually, I should say, or 6.30, I believe it is. Uh, you can go to our website and check for the details. And you want to get there because the really cool exhibit we have now is Harry Potter, the Exhibition. We are the world premier location for this exhibit, and it is chock full of all the best stuff you can think of from the Harry Potter stories and the movies. And we invite you to come see that stuff. But you need to get your tickets online for that. You know, we've been sold out way ahead of time, and we'd like to make sure that you have a chance to get in to see the exhibit too. So go online, go to the Franklin Institute at fi.edu, learn all about the exhibition, and Purchase your tickets in advance there. That's the best way to do it. In fact, if you can come during the week, it's a little bit less busy than it is on weekends. It's still fun on weekends, but if you can come during the week, it's a lot easier to find tickets and get in at a time when you'd like to get in. So if you go online, you can also pick and choose the date and time you want to come. So please make sure you go to the Franklin Institute's website and check out everything about Harry Potter and the exhibition. Also, if you're not really interested in that, don't forget. We have all of our great iconic exhibits open again, and we'd love to welcome you to our building where you can enjoy uh, the fun and games that we all have as we learn about science. And of course, the Franklin Institute's mission is uh, always there to inspire people to want to learn more about science and technology, and we invite you to come do that with us at Franklin Institute. So thanks for being with us this evening, folks. Uh, if you still have questions or if you posted a question and we didn't get to answer it this evening, we'll be sure to go back through all of our questions and we'll reach out to you and answer your questions uh, on our Facebook page. So thanks again. We look forward to seeing you next month for the May edition of Night Skies at Home. Thanks for joining us, folks. We'll see you next month. Enjoy the April skies. And don't forget, Easter comes up on the 17th of this month. So happy Easter, everybody. We'll see you next month. Thanks for joining us. Okay, but I will quit after you finally got it all together. I really enjoyed that joke. That was a lot of fun. It really that was, was fun. fun. I mean, I was trying to be keeping these jokes, you know, keep a little compilation of them. I think maybe we might do that. I mean, I think that would be a